it's very, very difficult in Germany to have an education at university level which is not liberal. Mm. Uh, and so someone like Bultmann and his predecessors and successors, they really are the ones who set the pace in theological thinking. So anyone who studies theology uh, will be influenced and very often subconsciously influenced by their theology. The kind of thinking that you're learning in university is actually not objective, it's highly subjective, but it's portrayed as this is the only objective way and everything else is childish. Good to meet you. Good to meet you too. Good. Friends, I've got a great privilege to uh, make friends with my friend Joachim Rieger. Is That's that right? right? That's right. Well done. And uh, he's a missionary from Germany and um, he taught at the Bible mission where my parents are and he uh, organized to come uh, and see me before he goes back home. Mm. And uh, we, we're going to have a very interesting conversation. He studied theology in Germany and uh, he's an evangelical Christian and I, I'm really confident that many of my friends who studied theology and who struggled mm. through German mm. uh, critical scholarship yeah. might benefit from our conversation. Yeah. So thank sure. you so much for the opportunity yeah. to talk. Sure, you're very welcome. Um, you, you grew up in Germany, in mm -hmm. Hamburg. That's your right. your mm -hmm. mom and dad converted. Your dad had a very mm. interesting um, experience as a doctor where mm -hmm. he converted later mm -hmm. on. Your mm -hmm. mom is also an evangelical Christian. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. uh, you told me you you became a Christian. You came under conviction of sin. How, mm -hmm. how old were you? I was maybe seven or eight. Yeah, I was a okay. young boy. Yeah. And and you want to just share something yeah, about that? Yeah, how sure. did that happen? Uh, I was just in my bed and I, I started reading the Bible as soon as I could read and going to school. And then I remember the one night the Lord just convicted me of my sin. I was like sometimes stealing some of the money out of my my mother's uh, purse and uh, sometimes I got angry with my siblings. I have three siblings and so the Lord just brought conviction. I was crying for my sin and I realized I, I need his forgiveness and so I, I just gave my life to him and asked him to forgive my sin uh, and he did. Yeah, so and, 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 and mom and dad, of course, they yeah. they modeled Christianity. Yeah. They did devotions. Yes, yes, they did. Uh, uh, yeah. you, you told me the story mm. about your father mm. who grew up, who was mm. uh, in his younger days a, mm. a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He became a medical doctor mm -hmm. and then he converted mm -hmm. and God radically changed him. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And no, you, could, yeah. See, you yeah. could see it in his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, before he was working very much, uh, we saw very little of him. He, as a medical doctor, he took over the practice of his father. So uh, he had been struck struggling because the, the medical practice had been closed for about six months so he basically had to start from scratch again uh, and so he worked a lot over the weekends as well, uh, night shifts, um, but as soon as he became a Christian he realized he needs to spend time with the family so from then on every Saturday afternoon we would have time as a family to play games together, to have devotions together, to sing and pray so I could really see the change in him. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes. So then you told me that you started to read Christian books, yes. uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. some of my favorite missionaries, yeah. Spurgeon, Hudson Taylor, Amy yeah. Michael, yeah. Mary Slessor, yeah. uh -huh. uh, yeah. you know, Judson. Yeah, Adoniram uh, Judson, yeah. Adoniram Judson, mm. William Carey, yeah. and so yeah. forth. And yeah. uh, I mean, it, it's quite remarkable to yeah. hear of a German yeah. uh, evangelical Christian yeah. who grew up reading these remarkable yeah. missionary books. Yeah. Uh, one or two of those books that yeah. really, uh, you know, had yeah. a great impact on your life? Yeah, I think Hudson Taylor's biography for me is amazing. Yeah, just to see because uh, the, the way that uh, his daughter-in-law wrote the biography, uh, she picks out a lot of details also from his younger years. And for me, as I was reading it, he was just 15, 16, 17 uh, when he, or 17 then especially when he got converted and then started serving the Lord where, where he was uh, and the kind of experiences he had really spoke to me because it was not like somebody already 35 and is already in ministry but uh, just to see how did he start his walk with God, learning to trust him, learning to obey. So for me it was a big challenge and a big blessing. I really enjoyed reading. Did, reading you, did you read where he dyed his hair and he almost uh, turned blind because he wanted to, to, to associate with the people? Okay, no, I don't remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remarkable story. Yeah, and yeah. for some years yeah. that, you know, there was yeah. almost no growth. Yeah. Mm. And then mm. they decided to mm. dress like the Chinese, yeah. the Chinese mm. and his hair. Yes, yeah. And then over time, God, yeah. God yeah. sent uh, yeah, yeah. a wonderful conversion. Yes, yes, no. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. So you read that yeah. as a teenager. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you, um, you wanted to go to university. And tell us mm. what happened, how you got a call uh, for yeah. theology. I think for me, when I, uh, when I was maybe about 15 or so, I felt in my heart that the Lord had called me to be a missionary. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, I didn't know how and when and uh, what the details of it would be, uh, but I just kept it in my heart. I kept praying about it. And when I was then finished with my school and my military service in Germany, uh, I had different options what to study. Uh, so first I started uh, studying business and information technologies and realized, okay, this, even though it might be a good avenue to be a missionary and self-supporting and so on, I felt this is not for me. Mm. Uh, so then I, uh, I did other options and I felt the Lord wants me to study theology. Um, and during my studies, uh, I worked in an evangelistic uh, cafe for refugees. So we had people come from all over the world and I could just always connect to the Africans. Like we had people from Asia, but somehow I, I just, for me, it, it didn't work. I didn't connect to them. Mm -hmm. But whenever there were people from Eritrea or Sudan, uh, refugees, I could just easily relate to them and I would visit them in their refugee camp and they would come and invite them over to my place. And mm -hmm. we always had wonderful fellowship. And for me, it was like, okay, it will be Africa. Okay, <laughs> yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Now, now let's just take a deep breath yeah. uh, because you mm. studied theology in Germany. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to university, mm. uh, uh, some of our liberal professors told us that we missed 19th century mm. German scholarship. Mm. And, uh, you know, the German 19th century liberal theology mm. uh, basically uh, had a tremendous impact mm. on, on theological colleges in South Africa yeah. worldwide. Yes. Mm. So, so before we get to your theological yeah. training, yeah. Um, just a couple of thoughts mm. on what happened. Um, mm. I was reading um, about a retired professor, Ulrich Wilkins. Mm. He was a a theologian, one of the universities, he mm. studied at Göttingen and Tübingen mm. and so forth. Mm. And uh, he, um, before he died, mm. he had a conversion and mm. then he started to write a theology of the New Testament. You mm. told me that you did some of that. Mm. And he told me the liberals just basically ignored yes. that. Yes. And then just shortly before he passed away, this yeah. book uh, uh, written by Professor Robert uh, Yabra, he's from mm. Covenant Seminary, mm -hmm. an interview with Professor Ulrich Wilkins. Mm. And this was the question to him. Mm. Your theology has fallen out of fashion mm. in Germany. Yes. <laughs> Do you have an explanation? Mm. And this is what he said, and then I want you to try and just mm. explain yes. to us mm -hmm. uh, what that means. Quote, we are dealing with no less than a captivity to radically critical liberal thought, mm. what we might call the ugly wide ditch, that was Lessing who mm. said that, mm -hmm. into which many have fallen in the wake of the Enlightenment and of the demythalization program mm. of Rudolf Bultmann. Mm. This theology bears atheistic features yes. and continues to spread. Mm. I made this development uh, the theme of my recent book that he wrote on critical scholarship. Mm. And then he said, my impression is that many theologians feel it is unnecessary even to engage with my arguments. Mm. Now, do you just quickly want to tell us mm. uh, the impact of someone like Rudolf Bultmann in mm. Germany, mm. how it worked and functioned in the universities. Yeah. And by the time you went to study theology at an mm. evangelical mm. Uh, college, mm. uh, explain to people the impact that mm. that scholarship has had on German theology. Yeah. If we look at the system in Germany, we can see that the uh, theological education really is in the hands of uh, the, the state church, uh, the Lutheran church. Uh, so all the theological faculties, they are, uh, they are basically run um, by, uh, by the Lutheran church. So uh, they, they are the ones who make all the appointments and so on. So uh, it's very, very difficult in Germany to have an education at university level, which is not liberal. Mm. Uh, and so someone like Bultmann and his predecessors and successors, they really are the ones who set the pace in theological thinking. So anyone who studies theology uh, will be influenced and very often subconsciously influenced by their theology. Uh, and um, th I think that is one of the things which I find very um, disturbing about liberal theology is that they start from certain presuppositions which they don't tell you. So students, they come, they believe in Jesus, they come to university, maybe they want to serve the Lord, they feel, okay, let me study theology, they study theology, and then from day one they are confronted with something that is ominous almost, like it's, it's, like it's not clear, it's not that uh, the words uh, or, or the, the things that are being said, it's not, it's not clear, it's not direct, but it's 
it's, it's subtle in the way that you're questioned, it's subtle in the way uh, your, your thinking patterns are questioned and it, it, like the, the idea you get is if you don't believe the way we believe then really uh, your child like or childish faith is, is really unreasonable and you, you, should, uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah. And I think many people they come into that setting not realizing what is going on and it's like taken for granted that the only acceptable theology is liberal theology and everything else is just not worth even mentioning let alone think about or think through. Uh, and I think that is uh, very much due to uh, Bultmann and then obviously theologians before him as well. I think from at least the 1880s, uh, um, maybe 1890s, uh, you, do, you don't find almost, there are exceptions like Schlatter, but uh, it's very, very difficult to find any evangelical or Bible-believing theologian in any of the German universities from the late uh, 19th century. Yeah. Can I yeah. just two yeah. thoughts as you sure. were speaking, I was mm. reading Schlatter yeah. and uh, from this book also Professor yeah. Bob Yarbrough, where he actually demonstrates how when he wanted to become a professor, yeah. Just to reiterate the point you're making, mm -hmm. how difficult it is mm. uh, to come into the system. Yes. Uh, the professor of the culture ministry told Schlatter yeah. when he wanted to do his habilitation, yes. mm. his second book, in order yeah. to teach at a German yeah. university. Uh, or, 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 you know, there are a couple of Switzerland and other universities, Baron, that were also influenced by the same yeah. kind of Lutheran tradition. Yeah. This is what the culture secret secretary told Schlatter. Yeah. He said, I've nothing against you becoming an instructor at, on the faculty, mm. but I assure you that I will not make you a professor. Mm. And then what happened, he had to do an examination mm. in the f five major subjects. Mm. And they told him in order for him to teach, mm. he has to get magna cum laude for every subject <laughs> in order yeah. to yeah. get the license. Yes. Which his, he did. his father passed away uh. during the time that he did it. Mm. He got it, and mm. guess what happened? Mm. After he'd got it, they lowered the standard again for everybody else. <laughs> yes. That's one example. Yeah. The other example yeah. is from Bootman as yeah. well. I remember giving a, a paper in Munster mm. a number of years ago, and the New Testament professor there, we had a pizza afterwards, he t and he did his uh, habilitation with one of Bultmann's mm. students, and he told me during our pizza time with some students that mm. Bultmann made sure mm. that he arranged appointments mm. for his students, mm. believed in uh, yeah. demythalization, yeah. reject the, the, the miracles, yeah. uh, followed form criticism, mm -hmm. for instance, every, all the traditions are legends, later mm. anonymous traditions that were brought together, the mm. woman at the tomb are later legends, mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, to, to arrange positions yes. for his students yes. all across Germany. Yes. So, yeah. so the, the Lutheran church mm. and, the, and the local authorities have mm. had a very strong mm. connection, isn't yes. it, yes, in, right. in German, yeah. in mm. ger German education? Yes. Is, is that right? That's right, yeah. And it's very difficult to get into the system, uh, especially in the northern part of Germany, where it's impossible, basically, to be an evangelical and to become a pastor. Uh, you're just sifted through, mm. um, sifted out. And if you want to be... Uh, teaching at a university, uh, I think to be an evangelical and then to be appointed, it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there's there's two people I know from my studies. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to become professors, uh, which I think capacity-wise, intellectually-wise, and so on, uh, they would be easily uh, able to do it. But the only avenue they, that is open for them is, I think both of them, they went uh, to try it in church history mm -hmm. uh, because in any uh, like Old Testament, New Testament, there would be no way they would get appointed to any university in Germany. Maybe Heidelberg, maybe, mm -hmm. because there are still sometimes some, uh, but other than that, no. L let me yeah. on Heidelberg, for yeah. instance. I've, mm. I've got a book here on multiple reformations that was mm. published recently. Mm. And the professor of New Testament at Heidelberg, mm. uh, he had a chapter uh, where he basically mm. just reaffirmed Bultmann saying mm. that we can't mm. go back mm. uh, to the pre-Bultmann time. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, at Heidelberg, where we've mm. had the famous Heidelberg catechisms, mm. Ursinus. Mm. 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 Uh, but even there, it looks like the, the impact mm. of the Enlightenment yeah. and historical criticism has been yeah. devastating. Yes. Uh, I mean, Professor Etta Linnemann, mm. who is the successor of Rudolf Bultmann, mm. the first female mm. professor of theology, mm. when, when she converted, mm. uh, she actually, two, two quotes, mm. uh, she said, uh, today I realize that historical critical theology's monopolistic character and mm. worldwide influence mm. is a sign of God's judgment. Mm. 
Mm. And then she talks of how by God's grace she converted. Uh, yeah. She was a small group and she uh, was convicted of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then she said, suddenly it was clear to me that my teaching was a case of the blind leading the blind. Mm. I repented for the way I had misled my students. Now, mm. just on misled, I've, mm. I've studied German scholarship for more mm. than a decade. Mm -hmm. and one of the things um, that I found absolutely remarkable, but I don't see people talk about it, mm. is that the so-called objective results of historical criticism mm. Mm. It has been um, over and over demonstrated that mm. it is inconsistent, yes. it is mm. not objective. Yeah. Talk to us just quickly about uh, Valhausen, mm. the famous Old Testament scholar mm. who popularized the view of the Pentateuch mm. and Genesis, mm. all these different sources, the mm. priestly texts, the Yahwist, the Elohist, mm. these mm. sources that were all you know, brought together. Yeah. Uh, Talk to us just quickly about your encounter with that mm. and how you can give some encouragement yes. to evangelical yeah. students who are struggling yeah. with those historical critical theories yes. that is still popular yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. all across the world. Yeah. I think the um, dishonesty maybe in the whole thing is that you, you come to university and the uh, the way universities present themselves is like we are on the search for truth. That's kind of the idea you get. So you come to university and you feel this is what everyone is about. We want to know the truth, we want to portray the truth, we want to uh, spread the truth. Uh, that is the idea you get. Once you're inside, you realize that's actually not the case. Obviously, nobody would dare to say that, but it really is about advancing yourself, advancing your career. And so in order to advance your career, you need to say things that haven't been said before. So if we take Wellhausen, maybe he starts off, it starts off with two theories. It's just the Yahweh and the Elois, then it must be four, then it must be the Deuteronomist and the priestly, da, 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 all those things. Uh, but then that is not enough because now that has been said. So, uh, and in Germany, we had uh, people then who found more and more sources. There is no objective evidence for it, but just in order to advance your standing, in order to advance some new theory that hasn't been told before, like the one guy I remember reading about, then he found 35 sources in the Pentateuch. And it's like, 35. Yeah, 35, yes. And it's just like, yeah, where's the objectivity now? Where, where can you verify anything? It's just a theory, you just throw it out there uh, just in order to be able to say something new. I remember Professor F.F. Mm. F. Bruce mm. from England. Yeah. Um, he, he um, I think, upset some of the German yes. scholars when he, <laughs> uh, and he was also a formidable mm. academic. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said something to the effect of um, this tradition mm. of having to say something new all the time. Mm. He said that, I think in the 70s or 80s, the mm. German uh, scholarly tradition mm. ran out of ideas. Mm. And in order to get something mm. published, mm. you have to say mm. something yeah. so radical yeah. and view, yeah. new that F.F. That Bruce sort yeah. of said, listen, yeah. we can start taking it yeah. seriously yeah. In, in, anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the things which is interesting to observe, even while I was studying, that's like 20 years ago now. Mm. Uh, but some of the non-evangelical, I don't know whether they were liberal, but some of the non-evangelical, at least uh, lecturers worldwide, mm. they started saying actually we need to push back on some of the ideas because uh, this is I don't know how to translate it but this is becoming now speculative uh, theology where there's no evidence anymore yeah. it's just speculations right yeah I remember studying uh, William Vreda mm. William Vreda uh, and he was one of those he was part of the um, the history of religion school mm. Göttingen you had Aaron Strulch mm. and you had a couple of some said Bultmann was sort mm. of the last one mm. and he worked with this uh, hypothesis that mm. We have to do exegesis without any presuppositions mm, mm. Uh, objectively, mm. and we have to get rid of all dogmatic mm. um, um, approaches to mm. theology. Yes. So he wrote a book about interpreting the New Testament mm. where he separated, mm. you know, all the things about the Trinity and mm. God and Jesus and yeah. the supernatural from the so-called yeah. objective parts. Yeah. And then he had a following of students. Mm. Uh, where he developed form criticism mm. uh, about all these anonymous sources mm. and then he worked on, as you will know, on um, Mark's Gospel, the Messianic mm. Secret, that was translated into English. And then his whole theory was we have to be objective mm. and separate the, uh, you know, the, the text from dogmas, mm. later church dogmas. Mm. And then he had a couple of student friends who followed him, who was mm. sort of now taking the bouton on from him. And I will never forget this. As mm. I did this research at Durham University, I discovered that for all his effort of finding this objective approach, mm. he, he did his messianic secret, 
And then he pinpointed the text. I think mm. it was chapter 9, verse 9. I'll check the mm. details of that. That is the text that explains the whole messianic secret mm. for mm. how the whole thing fits together. And then I discovered mm. not one of his own followers mm. agreed with him. <laughs> yeah. And that then eventually brought me back mm. to Luther and mm. Calvin and mm. reading what they said about the authority of Scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, you studying at mm. a theology college uh, mm. that subscribed to the inerrancy of Scripture, the mm. Chicago statement on that. Mm. And then I discovered that these so-called historical critical German heroes mm. are not more objective than Luther and Calvin. Yes. Mm. They start with a presupposition mm -hmm. and very often it's just circular yes. the mm. way they do it yes. and how they follow the whole thing. So let me, mm. let me read for you mm. from, from, from Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And I want you then you to just mm. talk to us about how this, this could have helped you mm. in your studies. Martin Luther said, you must renounce your own sense of understanding for with these you will not attain the truth, mm. but only with your own presumption precipitate yourself mm. and others along with you from heaven into the abyss of hell, mm. as happened to Lucifer. On the contrary, kneel down in your chamber and pray with real humility mm. and earnestness to God, to give you through his dear son, the Holy Spirit, to enlighten, guide and instruct you. Now, mm. as I was reading this, discovering Luther and Calvin's Institutes that says basically the same. Mm. The authority of scripture is mm. not based in me interpreting it. We are mm. sinners. We yes. are all sinners, corrupted mm. by sin. Yes. But in the Holy Spirit that mm. works conversion mm. and then illuminates mm. Uh, your understanding. Do yes. you un explain mm. how your own theological studies intersected mm. with what Luther and Calvin teaches on yes, this? Yes, yes, sure. I think for me, uh, it, uh, because I studied uh, logic just for one semester before I studied theology, uh, I always try to uh, analyze the, exactly the presuppositions that lead to certain conclusions. And for me, it's like there's only two options. Either God exists or he doesn't exist. If he exists, then to leave him out makes everything not objective. It's just logically. Uh, that's, that's the logical conclusion. Everything will be faulty if he exists. If he doesn't exist, you can do whatever you want to do and you can think whatever you think. If he does exist and he doesn't play a central role in the interpretation of scripture, you're going wrong. It's inevitable. And so I think Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians where he says, unless the Holy Spirit illuminates our understanding, unless he reveals the things to us, and Jesus taught about that as well, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach us. He will lead us into all truth. Now, if... Again, if God exists and he inspired his word, the Bible, then obviously for us to understand it, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit. There's no way a human limited mind can understand the thoughts of God unless God himself explains it to us. What does he mean by this, by this, by this? And for that we need the Holy Spirit. There's no way uh, that human understanding can reach the level of God's thoughts. I think Isaiah talks about that. Uh, where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And if we think, we can uh, draw the, 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 the thinking of God, the mind of God, down to our level and scrutinize his ways of thinking and revealing himself by our limited understanding. To me, that's the height of arrogance. Yeah. Mm. And I, as you talk, I'm mm. thinking of Immanuel Kant, mm. Mm. who basically made it impossible for mm. us mm. To, to talk like this. Yes. Now, now, we'll do another program when you come back, Lord willing, next year. Mm. Um, give, as you speak, I was mm. thinking about Luke 24. Mm. Uh, would, you, would you mind reading for us mm. just that sure. Bible? Mm. Yeah. Uh, those, the, the pink that I've highlighted. Mm. Uh, and then, yes. you, then you try to just unpack uh, yeah. how that can help us. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And I think there we can see that only a divinely inspired book could contain things that would be fulfilled hundreds of years later. So Jesus is talking about the prophets, uh, some of the prophets 800, 900 years before Christ. Uh, so hundreds of years before he lived, things were written about him, pointing to a, a future that none of the prophets could anticipate. And that only is possible when uh, something is divinely inspired. So Jesus is talking about that. And then he opens their minds because even though they had it and they had read it, uh, they knew about all the Old Testament prophecies. They needed now the divine interpreter to understand what do these verses actually mean. 
So then Christ actually could take that and say, look, my sufferings, my resurrection, it's, it's been uh, predicted by the prophets, and, but they needed him to explain to them because by their own limited mind, they couldn't get it. They couldn't understand. Oh, yeah. what, what advice will you give to mm. theology students mm. who are studying at liberal state mm. universities? If you can give a couple of um, pieces mm. of advice yeah. that can help them yeah to get through the other other end and still believe the gospel like you and I do. Yeah. I think one of the things they uh, they need to do is to question everything that questions them. Uh, because as everything is based on presuppositions, they need to question the presuppositions of the lecturers, which most of them are not honest enough to tell them, uh, which I find is not really uh, scientific or it's not even honest in, in, in dealing with one another. Uh, so question, uh, Question the presuppositions of the question what they are saying. For example, I think one of the um, major presuppositions of liberal theology, the, the father of liberal theology, Ernst Trölsch, like his his three basic elements of uh, of uh, that, that led to liberal theology. Question that. Question that. Is it is questioning everything? Like his first point, uh, criticism, criticism of everything. Is that actually an accurate way of dealing with truth? He says it is, but is it really? Mm -hmm. Analogy, is it only possible to, that's for something to be true and for something to be verified if it can be replicated today? Is that actually true? Does there have to be an analogy between what we see happening today and what we see in the Bible? Uh, is that actually true? Just question all these things. I think the second thing uh, for them to really find a group of, of uh, fellow believers, also uh, maybe um, uh, like uh, maybe believers who are more mature, who study theology themselves, uh, to answer some of the questions. Not, not to hide the questions in their heart and then start doubting, but whatever is there, find people to share with, uh, find people to ask questions with. Uh, because there will be things to go through, to think through, uh, and sometimes we need the guidance. Um, uh, also maybe guidance through books so read some of the books by people who were liberal before and then they, they met God in a radical way like Eta Lindemann mm -hmm. uh, she was very liberal and then she met God and uh, she became conservative and a missionary uh, in uh, Indonesia yeah. and yes yes mm -hmm. uh, so just just to see um, the, the kind of thinking that you're learning in university is actually not objective it's highly subjective but it's portrayed as this is the only objective way and everything else is childish can i just yeah. say on that as you were talking about trutsch mm. the, the way that the germans pronounce yeah. it nobody else can copy yes. that just say how you pronounce it ernst trutsch trutsch okay yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, i must make sure i don't <laughs> spit anybody when i say that yes. um <laughs> There's a professor in Stellenbosch, Professor yeah. Benny Kiet, mm. who studied under Hermann Barfink and mm. he did his doctorate mm. on Trulch. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and he did a whole, I've got the book here, we're yeah. actually working now on a conference on yeah. Kiet, where he, read, he wrote his whole thesis in Dutch at the mm. Free University okay. on mm. Trulch. Yeah. Trulch. Mm. And then his conclusion mm. is basically that it causes subjectivity. Yes. Yeah. So they had this quest for mm. this will be objective truth. Yes, this yes. is the, this is rational. This mm. is mm. this is not subjective like mm. the church. And then the, the end of the process is subjectivity. Yes. Mm. And that is what Prof. Benny Kiet then mm. actually at the end was one of his conclusions. And yes. then he draws us back yeah. again to Luther, to Calvin, to yeah. say that the Holy Spirit uh, reveals it to us, mm. but we also believe that it actually happened. Yes, it's, it's sure. not it's not irrational. Mm. We yes. believe that God has revealed Himself yeah. in space and time and in for history. Sure. For sure, uh, mm -hmm. and that is also the thing that Professor Wilkins was mm. arguing for here, mm. where they they just don't want to to take Him mm. seriously. Yes. Um, mm. Can I ask you, brother, sure. for f to do a prayer for us, sure. maybe for many students? Mm who are battling mm. Bultmann and Trulch yeah. uh, and Valhausen mm. uh, and forced mm. to swallow tho those presuppositions. Mm. And if you want to do a prayer for them, sure. mm. as a German brother in Christ mm. who, who converted, who's mm. evangelical, who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, mm. that God will preserve them and encourage them. Yes, sure. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray for those who are forced to think along lines that are really unhelpful and who are forced to read things that are destructive to their faith and their walk with you. I pray, Lord, that they will really seek you deeply. They will seek friendships with those who can help them. They will have an open mind and an open heart so that you can guide them, and provide the help that they need so desperately. I thank you, Lord, that uh, nothing that we believe, nothing that we see in your word, forces us to be irrational or foolish, because you are a God who loves truth, who gives us truth and who leads us also in thinking along the lines of truth. So 
I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling, that they will draw close to you and receive from you the answers that they need for their inner quest. Thank you, Lord, in you there's peace and joy and rest. Amen. Thank you.